So uh, I just want to back up. You are the uh, guitarist and also in many ways the composer, uh, the sonic composer um, for the band Nightmare. Um, uh, you have a new release that's coming out. We're going to get to that in just a minute. Yeah. What I'd like to talk to you about now is just, you're in Florida. You're originally from Germany, but now, is it the Tampa area that you live in? Yes, correct. I'm, I'm in Tampa, yeah. So how are things just for you right now as an individual and just in your surroundings? And then maybe, I know John is in New York, so maybe also if you feel comfortable, talk about how things are for the rest of the band. And I'll turn it over uh -huh. to you. Um, so here in Florida, uh, I'm doing okay. Uh, we are dealing with some fallout, uh, my wife and I, of the uh, whole corona situation. Not health-wise, we're both healthy, uh, as far as we know. <laughs> But um, uh, yeah, some career stuff is uh, you know is presenting some challenges to us, and uh, Florida, Florida notoriously is uh, pretty bad uh, and pretty behind when it comes to filing for unemployment and situations like that. So, uh, so I think the general the general situation in Florida is is a bit uh, subpar, I would say. Um, here in Tampa, to me, it seems like people haven't really taken it all too seriously. Um, the numbers in Tampa itself aren't too horrible, but there's not, um, it seems like there's not all that much testing going on. So, um, so it's a bit, it's easy to get a bit paranoid. Um, and we're just trying to, you know, do our part, uh, only go out for the most necessary stuff and, um, and deal with it uh, as long as we have to. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a pretty unique situation for sure. And, um, yeah, it's not Tampa, fun. Uh, and, and and, Tampa's, yeah. Tampa's in Northern Florida. Am I correct? Um, it's on the Gulf coast kind of handle area. Oh, uh, no, it's definitely lower. Okay. It's lower than, yeah, it's a bit lower. It's like halfway. Georgia's opening up like this weekend. They're starting to open up. And I can imagine being in Florida, you must be like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, Florida was also one of the latest states to have any uh, stay at home orders. Um, and even once those were finally out, uh, I had to um, I had to find a post office um, last Saturday, I think. And um Everywhere was just packed and I would roll up to a post office. Uh, it was more packed than ever. And I would just turn around and drive into the boonies and go to a, to a more empty post office. It's just, I'm, you know, trying, I'm trying not to get sick. And, uh, so yeah, it's, it's wild. It was also like parks are more packed than ever. Some parks where I would usually see like a guy walking his dog at, at, at the most, now all of a sudden you have people playing soccer and sitting under the gazebo. It's all, almost like uh, the, vibe, the vibe here is, oh, we can't go work, so let's all hang out. Um, so it's, it's kind of weird. Um, and then, you know, having someone in the band who lives in New York and knowing about the realities there, uh, it, just, it just boggles the mind. And um, yeah. Have you have you been? I assume you have been uh, in contact with John, and and I'm hoping that everything's going well for him and his kind of team yeah. up there, his connections, his friends. Yeah, we're all talking every day basically, and uh, then we have Keith in uh, Portland too, yeah. and Paul over in Germany. So we're getting a pretty broad stroke of um, just the overall global situation almost, and. Um, yeah, New York is pretty bad. Um, John lives in Brooklyn. Uh, he, I mean, he does what he has to do. He stays home most of the time. He walks his dog, uh, and he's careful. That's yeah. But it's it's pretty dire in New York for sure. Uh, and seeing the situation in the hospitals there and like the mass graves—that's some dystopian fucking shit. Yeah. 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 One of the things I think that we're all wrestling with. Uh, as individuals at the moment is how to keep some semblance of balance and normality and in my case maybe saneness just trying to keep it sane yeah uh, are, are there uh, are there any things that you're doing in particular I, I'm, I, I'm sure what's over your 
uh, shoulder there. Your guitars are one thing that you're turning to, but any shows or books or just anything that, that you've been doing to get through these strange times? Well, funny enough, since I'm mostly working as a freelancer, um, doing like recording, mastering stuff, uh, I've kind of revisited some old recordings of my former band and just literally started remastering three full albums just because there's time and, and uh, yeah, I've, I've, I'm just trying to stay busy kind of. And, um, and that to me, I, I feel like gives me the best sense of like a normal everyday life, I guess. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I guess I'm watching more TV than usual. Uh, we've been watching the new Bosch season, which is pretty good. Um, Absolutely, yeah. The new show called Deaths, which is on uh, Hulu. Yeah, uh, like into like the fourth or fifth episode now, I think, right? Uh, it's actually, I think, the last episode um just aired a couple of days ago well, like we watched it it felt like the last episode so um yeah that was that was pretty wild a pretty wild show um and what else watched a couple of movies but uh yeah it's it's i'm listening to more music even more music than usual too um funny enough i haven't found myself in a creative space yet i mm. but it, it's difficult for me anyways to get to get into that mind frame and I kind of have to force myself into it sometimes. So now where everything is a bit more existential, I don't want to succumb to the pressure of quote unquote, having to be creative or whatever. So, um, if I reach that point where it's just, where it just feels natural, I will, you know, sit down and, and write something. Um, but yeah, I'm mainly working funny enough, working on old music, and preparing a couple of re-releases and stuff like that, just getting into some some stuff that's still within the periphery of, of making music, but not necessarily being creative, because uh, the creative phase, the big creative phase uh, for Nightmare, at least, is already behind us, and uh, so I'm just kind of trailing off now. Yeah, and, and this, this is actually a, a really good segue into, um, you, you've just recently mm -hmm. uh, released uh, a brand new song, uh, Metastasis, and then help me with the parenthetical part. Uh, primordial Grit. Yes, exactly. Um, heavy as fuck, right from the opening, right out of the gates. It's, it's, it's great. But I, I want you to talk about, I, I know that the process for writing this was significantly different or somewhat different from Cacophony of Terror. Um, which was an album that I love. That's how you kind of came across my radar. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe if you could just take some time and compare the process of the of the new material and then with the old. And, and I know that you're super excited about the new material, and I understand why, having listened to it quite a bit, that one song. So I'm just going to turn the stage over to you and you talk about the process for us. So um, Cacophony of Terror, that basically came out of my old band um the drummer and i decided to keep uh writing and playing music together and so um before we even called it quits with our old band we had already kind of laid out the plans for nightmare and then um cacophony of terror took a very long time to write because it kind of overlapped with me moving from germany here to the us and stuff like that and um and having having been forced to write a lot of it on my own, um, it just, I mean, all in all, it took like three and a half years to write the album, which is very, very long. Uh, and um, yeah, it was just, it was a pretty isolated process for the most part. Um, but Paul, uh, he came over to uh, the US in 2016 uh, in summer, and we, we wrote like half of the album together just during those, to two weeks and um and then the rest of it just is what took so long um but yeah all in all we spent like three and a half years on it and i feel like um there were there are like up and down sides to that i think the, the the good thing about it is that i was very uh meticulous about it and i felt like i wanted to 
achieve a very, very coherent atmosphere. And so the album is very coherent, I think. Um, there's a, it's a very distinctive vibe, and I feel like it really doesn't change throughout the album. So, so like the oppressiveness of it is just it just keeps up from the first song and goes all the way through uh, to the end. And um, I think spending maybe spending a little too much time on it uh, mm. made that even more made that even more like prevalent. But like um, with the new material, so the song we released, um, it is going to be on our next album, but we, uh, last year we welcomed a new guitarist um, and his name is Keith, Keith Merrow. Yeah. Uh, he does a lot of solo stuff and he uh, has a project called Conquering Dystopia with uh, Jeff Loomis. And he contact contacted me last year when we were on tour and um, I knew about him, but we had never talked before. And he was like very interested in the band and like, uh maybe joining even and so we just talked quite a bit and hit it off quite well and uh realized that we were into the, a lot of the same kind of music and so we decided to give it a shot and then last september uh john and i went to portland to just try and write some music with him and uh the song that we released um primordial grit that all, that was all written within the first day of Keith and I sitting down and writing something together. It was, I mean, I brought one of the riffs with me, or one and a half riffs, and he had already kind of tried to uh, work with it a little bit, but basically we sat down in the morning and then in the afternoon the song was done. And uh, yeah. That's, good. That's a good day's work. That is a good, yeah, for sure. It was great. It just, it just, clicked and worked out really well and then the next day um we just decided spontaneously to record vocals too because john was there he was more there to like hang out and maybe maybe record vocals but maybe not and um so keith just happened to have a decent vocal mic there and so we sat down wrote, wrote lyrics and worked out the vocal patterns and arrangements and then that was another half day's work and the song was done and uh yeah, it was a great process. And then Keith and I sat down and wrote another song, uh, which will also be on the album, but uh, it, it's been a little like rearranged since. But still, it, it was a great, it was just a great experience. We were, um, it was just, yeah, a very quick process. And you, um, went, you went from three and a half years yeah. to basically 36 hours, it seems like. <laughs> Talk yeah. about you know, for oh, one correctly. song, three and a half years was for an entire album's yeah. worth. But I think that speaks to at least the organic connection that you guys felt at a musical level right away. Absolutely. And it's the same with when I get into a room with uh, Paul, our drummer, it's the same thing. Paul and I have played music together for um, 13 years at this point. Th so is this, going, is this going back to War for a Harlot's Mouth? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted yeah. to get, I think we've talked around the name, but I figured I would just... Yeah. Go, go Absolutely. Ahead. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Him and I were uh, in uh, the band War from a Hardest Mouth, yeah, and we, so him and I have played music together for a long time, and, and we, uh, it's very, it's a very organic process between the two of us as well. Um, but yeah, so, you know, welcoming Keith kind of worked out the same way, and um, when it came to writing the album, funny enough, uh, Paul decided to come over to the States again and he visited me uh, here in Florida. And so we wrote about half of the album between Paul and I. And then I went to NAM right away after like two weeks. And then uh, I went from NAM, I went to Oregon and worked with Keith for another week. And so the entire album was written in three and a half weeks and not three and a half years. <laughs> so it's just. It just kind of happened. Uh, it was great. And that for some reason, I didn't even feel burned out or anything. But it was a very, very quick process. Paul was here. He came over here right before the new year, spent a little over two weeks. And uh, and yeah. And then another week we spent at Keith's. Um, and it was great. We just, everything worked out really well. And, um, and yeah, funny enough, the result, I think, is... You would think if you know you would think that uh, when you work in a more compressed time frame, the result would be more coherent than when you're writing an album over several years. But I feel like it's kind of the opposite, where now we branched out a little bit 
into certain dynamics that weren't necessarily a part of the last album. And as much as I love Cacophony of Terror, I'm very happy and proud of that record. But um, I think I think replicating that same vibe and tonality and and whatnot, I think would have would have been a little stale. So being able to branch out and incorporating like Primordial Grid, I feel like is a bit more of a mid-tempo black metal-ish kind of track. Yes. Um, I think it still fits fits with the vibe of, of Cacophony of Terror, but um, it's a different dynamic and uh, it doesn't appear to be going quite as low in regards to guitar tuning, although it's written in the same tuning, it's just written in a different key. So that's something we experimented quite a bit with uh, on the new album. There, there is, there is one part at the very beginning of the song when, when you do drop down to an incredibly low note in the mm-hmm. opening riff, and when you do, the lowness really sticks out because you're up higher, I think, on the uh, for the riff, and then when you kick down to that low note, it hits you right here in that opening riff, and I think it actually accentuates when you do go low in some ways. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. What, I think. What? No, go no, ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, you know, it's just, uh, I think that was kind of the idea of trying to to create some like peaks and valleys sonically and dynamically and, uh, and um, yeah, writing in different keys was like one way for us to break out of falling into the trap of just repeating the same thing we've done before. Although there's material on the new album that is in line with what we've done before, but I think we expanded a little bit. Um, and there are like songs on it that are definitely more chaotic and dissonant than what was on the last album, but also um, like Primordial Grid, songs that are maybe the structure is a bit more simple, but the vibe is kind of pushed forward even even more. So yeah, it's, it's, it was a good it was a good process, and and uh, I really like the results. That's incredible. There's there. I want to go in like a number of different directions now. Yeah. And I'm not kind of sure which one to pick. Um, but but I'm I'm gonna go down one just that I I, need, I maybe it's just me who's interested in this. And if so, we'll edit it the fuck out of the video. Um, but uh, when I think of you and your style and the music that you've uh, been uh, kind of put together in the past, obviously dissonance is a word that you yourself embrace. Um, And I think certainly in Chasm, the EP, and then in Cacophony of Terror, et cetera. Um, And and I'd like you to talk a little bit about that. But then also the other thing that I find fascinating about the music is that you have a willingness to embrace what I would loosely call kind of openness or space. In other Mm -hmm. words, you don't start at 16th notes and just see how, you know, you're not about cramming as many notes as you can into every beat or every measure. Um, yeah. and, and, and so I, so to me, that's, um, as makes your style as, uh, unique as the embracing of the dissonance. So I was just wondering if you could talk about dissonance and spacing within music and kind of your framework for looking at that. For sure. Well, I think, First and foremost, uh, I really don't like tech death metal or whatever too much. Um, so because I feel like the, sometimes the more uh, musical information you cram into uh, a shorter time frame, that like the, just the, the less vibe there really is to latch onto. It maybe it's technically impressive, but it's just not. Um, you don't really leave room for atmosphere. And like, I think for, for Nightmare, the main goal is always to create um, a very particular atmosphere through the music. And sometimes you can create that by going a little crazier and be, maybe getting uh, more chaotic and more technical. But I, as, as a rule of thumb, I, I definitely try to, to leave a lot of room for, for vibe in our music. And I think one of my, my big influences when it comes to that is uh, Triptychon and Celtic Frost. Uh, Monotheist was like a super influential album for me. And uh, that was, I, I think, one of those albums where I was like, okay, this is so simple but so evil. And I, don't, I can't even like put my finger on it because some of those riffs, if you, 
if they weren't played in the way they are, they would almost sound kind of dumb, you know? If you, if you think about the song Progeny, right? I mean, yeah. th these riffs are incredible. If you wrote the tabs out, they would be like, really? Yeah. But the feeling behind each note is insane. And the production, I I, yeah. I quite frankly think that Peter did an incredible job on that album. Oh, that production just really took that over the top. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, also, I also hear... I hear influences of God flesh in you, and, and sure. in particular, and so am I not hearing, if, just help me with, with Broderick. I hear some of that, and also Jezu, quite frankly, um, beyond just kind of the obvious, but some of his later material maybe as well. Well, I'm, I can definitely say that I, I'm a big fan of both, um, and I feel like in recent years, uh, or oh, with Nightmare, once we started Nightmare, the on Cacophony of Terror, there's like some subtle industrial metal elements in there. Uh, the end of Tidal Waves of Terror comes to mind, or a Cave Digger has some things going on. Um, even on the, the middle of Cave Digger, by the way, the middle part of Cave Digger that comes out of nowhere and it's just <laughs> that gets back to the atmosphere and the in the feel. I'm sorry, but I yeah. just I about that. Yeah. No, absolutely, and and even on the Chasm EP in. Um, well, it's the song title, A Vessel of Nausea. Um, there, even, even in that song, we have some industrial type percussion sounds that a friend of mine um, helped me um, put together. And so I always felt like it, would, it was very fitting with our music and uh, especially in the, in the more spacious parts to give those parts more, even more vibe and atmosphere that's a little bit different maybe. Uh, and also quite frankly, for a band like ours, I feel like a lot of dissonant extreme metal bands go for a very raw and organic production style. But my my influence for Nightmare when it comes to the to the production style comes more from industrial metal or even some doom metal. Cacophony of Terror, when we worked with the mixing engineer, I told him, I literally showed him a shape of this pair album, which is Funeral Doom, but it, there was like, there's like a, a space kind of on that album, a monotony fields, where I was just like, I kind of want this in our music, and I understand that that's a challenge with all the blast beats, but do your best, you know, try to incorporate that. And and yeah, and so yeah, God flesh in a way, you know, the, the the massiveness that you can, the massive kind of sound you can you can get from from industrial metal productions, I feel like is what kind of inspired us to to go a less raw and organic way and rather aim for something big and um i think it's a bit it at least offers a different perspective on this in an extreme metal um to not go the like super raw uh route you know um so but yeah I, for sure i i was noticing to segue away from that now i was noticing mm -hmm. um i think it was on facebook recently you guys uh had put a post out and um from from what i understood one uh, there's some cool merch things going on that I want us to talk about because right now is a difficult time for artists. And sure. one of the purposes of these videos is to get out anything that you guys are doing relative to maybe merch or something. But mm -hmm. backing up, I noticed that um, this song uh, was independently released. And uh, the sense I got from what I saw on Facebook was that's the direction that you're going in now. And I was wondering if you could, uh, if you would feel comfortable just talking about uh, the decision kind of behind that, what led to that, and what what kind of made you go in that direction. Uh, yeah, for sure. We haven't really um, spoken about it too much as a band. We haven't, I don't know, made any official uh, statements in regards to how we're moving forward. But uh, we actually did separate from uh, our label Season of Mist. We didn't have to, but we kind of wanted to, and uh, it wasn't on bad terms or anything. It was just something, uh, having played in, you know, extreme bands for 15 years or whatever, uh, it just kind of felt like something, something that we wanted to do to be more flexible in regards to releasing music uh, whenever we want and in whichever format we want. And there are some limitations. When you're with a label, you're on their schedule and uh, there are limitations to 
what pressing plans does the label use, uh, how far can you really get your vision across, and um, and then also the reality is, uh, as much as you benefit from a label and their reach and influence in, in the industry and metal scene, you do give up a huge part of your potential um, revenue from music. It just, it's hard to get out of the hole, basically. And, um, you know, like just going through the numbers and everything, it, it felt like, uh, hey, we can probably, we can probably do better by doing our own thing. And so we're um, in the process of starting our own label imprint and uh, we're just gonna take that step now. I mean, uh, and I think it's a good time, you know, especially with the Corona situation, <laughs> who knows? I expect the music industry to have sort of a soft opening once things start rolling again. And I know for I know that a lot of labels are not releasing anything right now. They're not signing new bands. So I assume a lot of new music is going to be produced during that time regardless. And then if you're not a big priority band on, on a big label, you're going to be somewhere at the bottom of, of a list, uh, of a waiting list to be released. And um, who knows when we, could, when we would have been able to put out our next album if we were at the bottom of you know a list like that. So, so being... Being completely independent enables us to just put out whatever we want, whenever we want it. And right now the situation is so difficult. I wouldn't want to put out an album right now anyway, even if I could. But, you know, putting out a single and doing doing something special with that, if you can, uh, that's, that's a good way of kind of working around it and testing the waters a little bit too to see if people even have the frame of mind right now to listen to new music or buy new music or whatever. So I think it's just... It's a matter of taking taking full control uh, and yeah, just running with it. I think the time is right, and I'm sure we will see a lot of things changing in the music industry going forward. Just because it's struggling, and I empathize with that. Uh, 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 you know, I feel for I feel for labels who are struggling, and I feel for Season of Mist. And you know, it's a it's a really really tough situation, and I think it will force a lot of us to to change our ways a little bit and I'd rather do it independently and have full control over the process. And yeah, I mean with the single, because you mentioned the merch, uh, yeah. the thing that we are, we're, we're doing with the single is that we uh, are putting out like a limited long sleeve that is based on, on the design is based on the video we made that Keith made the video himself in his home studio. Like a lot of what we, what we're doing is, made in house uh the only things about that single that weren't recorded by us were the drums and then we had it mixed by someone else um but we're doing a lot of the work in house and so uh yeah the design the, sh the long sleeve design was done by our drummer and uh the long sleeve is only going to be sold in a limited time frame we're going to end pre-orders for that on friday and we're not, never going to reprint it again and i kind of like the idea of making smaller runs of things rather than just throwing something out there and you know having it dwell in in our merch store forever or whatever i think i think just being able to to make small stuff um it's a, it's a little more exciting for for people i think and it, it's more fun for me uh to to put limitations on things sometimes it yeah Absolutely. So folks can find that. What are the, where are the different places that somebody, is there a band camp and then other places that people could go? I'll put a link in the comments. I'm not a pro yet for all these fucking things about pointing to where the link is going to go. But um, talk to me about where people can go to find that stuff and also the new single as well. Yeah, I, th I mean, the best address is nightmare.bandcamp.com. Uh, we have our all of our merchandise uh, on Bandcamp, as well as the single. You can download that for free or pay what you want. Um, we did the same with our EP, Chasm, and we're probably, quite frankly, going to do the same thing with our next album. I think, uh, I think there are so many ways of listening to music for free anyway, or more or less for free. You could listen to the album on YouTube or you could listen to it on Spotify. So why am I going to charge you ten dollars for an album going forward? I'd rather, I'd rather people treat it like a tip jar, and they can decide how much 
how much the music is worth to them or how much they can or want to support the band. And I understand that some people simply don't have the means to spend $10 on, on an album. And so I'd rather let them decide and give them whatever they can or want, uh, rather than closing the door in front of their faces, you know, with a set price. And I think, um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's how we do it on Bandcamp right now. When you buy a merchandise uh, article, you get the single for free as well. Whatever like, people can can spend money on the uh, on the on the single if they want to, but they really don't have to. And I'm not mad. I'm not mad when people don't spend money on it. I'm glad it's go it's getting out there, especially right now. So uh, yeah, that's definitely going to be part of uh, how we do things in the future as well. Um, and I think I think it's a it's a good way of looking at it. And on the other hand, we're going to do more exciting physical stuff like the vinyl pressings for the next album are going to be outrageous you know so we yeah. we get to have fun with that and people can spend money on that but they don't have to necessarily spend uh arbitrary amounts on digital copies of whatever they they want to listen to and uh and again limitation i think limiting things to a certain degree is fun for everyone and gets people a little more excited too so i think there's like an interesting balance to be struck with that um and we still we will work out the kinks with that, um, but I think in general it's a good it's a good way of moving forward. Absolutely, absolutely. I have one last question for you, mm -hmm. and and then I'll, I'll let you go. Um, and that's just <clears throat> given what the hell we're going through right now. Um, what what's that thing that you just can't wait for when we reach the other side of this shitstorm? Um, what's the one thing, and and it can be it can be something simple like, man, there's this place that makes the best, you know, milkshakes, and that's where I want to go. Or it can be something global. But what, what's the thing you're looking forward to? I think personally, for me, uh, we did have plans to go over to Europe with the band uh, in October, and I'm quite sure that that's not going to happen. Just that would, very that's fast, right? Um, yeah, that was Berlin Death Fest, some some festivals, some really cool stuff. Um, but I'm just not very confident that uh, the world is going to be at a state where it's going to be easy for people, especially here in the U.S., where we have more cases than anywhere else and there's no end in sight, really. Um, you know, maybe being an American resident is going to make it especially hard to uh, travel to Europe for a couple months. It's just a reality, you know. It's uh, That's called instant karma, I think, in some ways as well. I guess, I guess you could call it that, yeah. So, you know, who knows what's going to happen with that. And um, I am looking most forward to uh, being able to travel back over to, to Germany and uh, even just on my own to, to visit my family and friends. Uh, I typically go to Germany once a year. And uh, I already had to, um, I was already not able to do it in 2018 because uh because my green card extension process was ongoing and it's not recommended to travel internationally necessarily during that time. So, um, so I, I haven't been able to, to go back home once a year since I moved here and it's all looking like that's not going to happen this year either, which is a bummer. So that's probably what I'm most looking forward to. Um, and other than that, just being able to, uh, socialize a little more off camera. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Although my my circle here in Tampa is small, but it's it's a it's a nice small circle, and I do see people, and uh, and so yeah, it, uh, that's definitely something I'm looking forward to. But uh, record stores, shop, yeah, shopping for records in an actual store. We have some cool ones here in, here in Tampa. Uh, Steelworker Records is a very good extreme metal met, uh, record store in our neighborhood, and uh, the owner is awesome and. Uh, you know, I hope uh, the store will survive this and then I'll be able to go and buy some shit from him and help him make it work, you know. So that's, that's yeah, that's me. Well, I wanted to uh, take uh, take the opportunity to thank you, Simon, uh, for yeah. taking the time to, to talk. Uh, I want to encourage anyone who watches this video, it's really worth checking out this new single. Um, it's awesome. I'm very excited to see where uh, the rest of the material goes as you release it. Cause um, 
uh, I'm a big fan of Nightmare personally, and I think uh, it's going to be exciting to see this new release. So thank you very much. Stay safe. You too. Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate the, the interview, you know, and appreciate talking to you. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll get to see each other again soon in Seattle.